All right, thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, sorry about that um, slight confusion. Uh, we'll continue straight on, and I will need my notes um, to introduce our next panel. Um, this is a kind of a, a, a strange situation where all the speakers are on Zoom and the moderators in the room, so hopefully um, we can make this work. And I might actually sit on that side. I can see them as well. But um, uh, we are delighted to have a really great panel uh, and a highly thoroughly international panel with speakers in Europe and Asia um, uh, uh, in, on, for this next session on news and automation. And let me just go to my notes, apologies for that slight delay. Um, we have uh, uh, Rasmus Kleis Nielsen from the Oxford, Inter uh, sorry, the Oxford, the Reuters Institute for the, for the Study of Journalism at Oxford. We have uh, Wiebke Lawson from the uh, Leibniz Institute for Medienforschung and Hans Bredow Institute in Hamburg. Um, we have uh, Edson Tandog from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And we have David Tomczak from the Oxford Internet Institute, um, where he is a visiting pol policy fellow, and in his day job, he is um, the head of digital and innovation with the New Statesman. Um, so we have a really fantastic, high-powered, diverse panel um, here with us today. And um, we'll hear uh, from them with some opening statements to start with um, before we then uh, go to discussion and uh, Q&A. So keep those questions on Slido coming as well as, as we go. But um, I'll, I'm going to throw first to uh, Rasmus Kleis Nielsen Rasmus is the director of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism and the professor of political communication at the University of Oxford. Um, he was uh, previously the director of research at the Reuters Institute and editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Press Politics, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with in this field. Um, his work focuses on changes in the news media, on political communication, the role of digital technologies in both, and he has done extensive research on journalism, American politics, and various forms of activism, as well as a significant amount of comparative work in Western Europe and beyond. And uh, I'd, just, I'd just really like to throw to, to Rasmus, I guess, and um, ask him, particularly also from the, uh, the work that the Reuters Institute's doing with the annual uh, digital news report, uh, yeah, where he sees the current trends in the field of news and automation. So Rasmus, over to you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for this opportunity to share some of our research. I mean, I suppose the, the starting point here really is a sort of a central tenet of our work at the Reuters Institute, which is uh, our belief that journalism exists in the context of its audience. And if we want to understand the way in which uh, news circulates in our societies, how it's produced, how it's funded, um, how people think about it and may sometimes act on it, <clears throat> we need to understand the relationship between news uh, and the audience. And that's the underlying tenet of the annual uh, Reuters Institute digital news report, uh, where we um, survey represented samples of internet users in 46 markets across the world to get a better understanding of how they use the news and how they think about news in the media. And I think that source of data, which some of you will be familiar with, and, and it's freely available online. So please you know, use the digitalnewsreport.org website or write to us if you're interested in the original data for further analysis. I think that data can really get us a sort of a starting point to think about news and automation through the lens of us as citizens. If we start with the question of discovery, how do people come across their news? And I know that in the course of the day, you talked about the role of the platforms, which is one that will reemerge here, because I think that the first thing I'll say based on our research is that automation is still at this stage much more done to news by platforms that we as citizens rely on to discover news than is done by news organizations or journalists who produce the news and publish the news. So if we look at the question of discovery, most uh, internet users use a number of different ways to find and access news online. But when we ask people the follow-up question, what is your main way of accessing news online? Across the markets that we look at, which together account for about half of the world's population, it's less than a third who say that uh, going direct to a news site or app is their main way of accessing news online. And the majority rely on different forms of distributed access, uh, normally enabled by platforms such as search engines, most importantly, of course, Google, 
social media, Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, uh, Twitter, or aggregators for that matter. Again, Google looms large, but also Apple uh, and Update and various uh, competitors in that space. And of course, in all these cases, uh, automation is absolutely essential to how uh, news is ranked, how it's displayed, how it's personalized, how it's served up um, to individual citizens. So this is the first point I would say is that automation is done to the news by the platforms that we rely on as citizens. And again, I think this is a theme that's um, popped up in the course of your conversation today. It's not always clear that we as citizens are aware of this. I mean, it's obvious that, that none of us really have a detailed technical understanding of these things, like we you know, don't have a technical understanding of many of the things we rely on in a complicated modern world. But even at a very basic level, a few years ago, when we asked a digital media literacy question of our respondents, of how the things they see in their Facebook feed is uh, ranked. Uh, about a third of the respondents flat out just said that they didn't know. Uh, about a third correctly answered that this involves uh, computer analysis, algorithms to use a, a $10 word uh, of data uh, on, on what, we, what each of us use and who we're connected with and so on and so forth. Uh, and about a third gave various answers that are incorrect, such as it's selected by journalists who work for Facebook, or it's uh, you know selected by the government, for example. So there are clear limitations still to even very basic media literacy of these forms of information. I want to also just sort of briefly share a few uh, further data points to sort of um, set up uh, what we'll hear um, from Vitka at and, and David in terms of how our research may feed into that if they were this institute. Uh, in addition to the way in which, uh, you know, we as citizens rely on platforms and in turn rely on automation, it's clear that of course publishers that produce um, and publish the news are also increasingly using various forms of uh, automation in their own work. Now, um, we'll hear more uh, details on that from the research done by others on this panel, but I think it's useful to think for a moment about what this looks like from the point of view of senior editors and executives who make many of the key decisions in these media organizations. We do every year a survey of uh, leaders in digital news, and we have asked, for example, about what forms of AI um, and which areas of AI uh, leaders in digital news are most interested in. And I think here it's, it's quite interesting to note that while from our point of view as users, as I said before, automation is very much about discovery. From the point of view of news leaders, uh, automation, I think at this stage is essentially it's primarily about business and about efficiency. And the two sort of areas that we see leaders in digital news expressing most interest in uh, investing in automation around are automated recommendations, very sort of classic, you know, you, if you're interested in X, you might also be interested in Y, the sort of onwards journey at the bottom of news articles, for example. They're interested in a range of commercial uses that are often sort of highly focused on either propensity to pay for subscription models or ad placement and ad load um, for advertising based uh, organizations, as well as things that I think for, for, for those of us who you know, come to journalism as citizens may seem quite sort of boring in a way, but actually incredibly important, which is sort of the whole back end question um, of automation of workflows in newsrooms that in turn enable further automation. So tagging, for example, transcription, subbing, all the ways in which uh, news articles can cease to be 400 words and a still image that sort of floats somewhere in the internet and in a content management system and become structured data that could be used in all sorts of different ways by the publisher behind. These are some of the areas that we see leaders in digital news expressing interest in investing more effort in the future. So at this stage, I think automation is still more done to news by the platforms we rely on as citizens, but I'll also see more and more investment uh, in automation by news organizations in the years ahead. And I think one of the questions we face there is, are those investments gonna reinforce the strong winner takes most dynamics we see in the industry already that has sort of spurred consolidation and, and largely sort of benefit um, the largest uh, players by increasing barriers to entry, by creating data economies to scale, uh, or are they uh, gonna be an example of a new technology that facilitates lean, small and focused brands by offloading expensive distribution, back office and sales functions, both or, or something else entirely. Um, but with that, I'll look forward to hear from the other panelists into the conversation as we continue. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Rasmus. Um, you may not be able to notice, but we're in the middle of a thunderstorm here in Brisbane, so we had some wonderful Max Headroom style um, effects on, on you as, as you were presenting, uh, but uh, uh, we, you got through the thunder all right, so thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'll hand over straight to uh, Wiebke Lohsen. Uh, Professor Wiebke Lohsen is a senior journalism researcher at the Hans Bredow Institute for uh, Media Research in Hamburg and a professor at the University of Hamburg. Um, her major areas of expertise are the transformation of journalism within a changing media environment, theories of journalism and methodology, and her current research focuses on the changing journalism audience relationship, the datafication of journalism, forms of pioneer journalism and the emerging startup culture in journalism, as well as algorithms, journalism-like constructions of public spheres and reality. So, Wiebke, over to you. Thank you, Axel, and uh, yeah, good morning from Hamburg to everybody. <laughs> um, to be honest, I prepared three slides to illustrate what I think is important when it um, when we talk about news and automation. And and would you mind if I share my my screen? Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I do it. Can you see it now? Okay. Yep. So um, one slide is about uh, the agony of defining what we are talking about in the first place. And Rasmus already highlighted some, some aspects and issue, issues when it comes to news and automation. And the second one is about the human factor. So it's not only that we only talk about technology. And the third one that included three theses on what I think these development are about in a broader sense, seen from a broader theoretical conceptual perspective. So the agony of the definition. So when we talk about automation and AI, it is of course not unimportant what exactly we are talking about and what technologies can do. But even more crucial than hard definitions, I think, is what people understand by them and what ideas they hold about the possibilities and challenges um, when using um, such technologies. So this definition, for example, is based on a survey of various newsrooms and reflects the comp complexity and the broad understandings of the technologies and their various applications. And, and Rasmus, you already mentioned some of them. So um, when we talk about AI and automation, we talk about different th things that mean di different things to people. So they often they refer to the term or the ideas to advanced technology. They talk about machine learning, about intelligent agents, about technologies that can to some extent automate tasks in the newsroom. Um, the human factor should neither be forgotten or underestimated when it comes to technology and its implementation, for example, in newsrooms, because ultimately these ideas we have about technology are, uh, are hardly less powerful than what it can actually do. I would like to il illustrate that with this quote here. It comes from a friend of mine. She is a journalist. She does TV, podcasts, write books. And this is what she said when I told her what I'm talking about today. Oh, I think this is totally exciting. I would have to read up on the topic first, but, but, but spontaneously, I think that the journalistic feature, immediate experience, personal assessment, entertainment, everything a journalist incorporates to drive facts can never be replaced by AI. And if it should come to that, I don't know if I want to witness that. The thought alone scares me. I also think the aspect is so important that this development goes hand in hand with self alienation and with self doubt and the shattering of identity. If an algorithm comes closer to what defines me, my empathy, my senses and my perception, then I'm threatened in my mental existence, so to speak. So these are very strong words, but we are used to talk to people that are expert in the experts in the field. And that is not the case for everybody in journalism, uh, to be honest, only for a few people. So I think we are talking about the tension between automation of communication and of communicative automation in a broader sense. 
So since the Turing test, there's an ongoing discussion to what extent the intelligence of automated system is, exclu is exclusively an attribution on the part of humans or not. However, um, what a can technology can actually do is only one aspect more important than the question of how intelligent it is, I think is the question, is the question how it participates in communication. That is how it becomes a partner in communication. When it comes to communication, we are therefore dealing with a kind of what I'd like to say soft automation in contrast to hard automation as we knew it from product manufacturing processes in which robots build things. As this kind of soft automation stands for uh, automation that builds on data and digital traces. This is a byproduct inherent to digital uh, digitalization. So user traces when it comes to use in use, for example. This characterizes a kind of communicative autom automation. That is an automation of social processes that go beyond the act of communication itself. So, and that is also a reason why uh, the business case when it comes to data is so important. However, the automation of communication and communicative automation do not only concern personal human machine communication. They also affect public communication, not only influencing the dynamics of public spheres through social bots, but on an already very fundamental level because they are becoming increasingly important for the, for the production distribution and news of journalistic offerings, our main topic today. So when we talk about journalism, we are dealing with an automation of communicative labor. I think this is important to keep in mind because journalism has an influence on far reaching societal communication processes. It's not only about journalism's internal processes and routines, the back end of journalism, as you said, Rasmus. This is the basic reason why we have to be interested in the question of who is involved in the production of journal, uh, journalistic communication and how. This applies also more and more to tech firms, but also to non-humans or actants, as Latour says, um, who are taking on more and more tasks in journalism that serve to fulfill journalistic performances. So particularly when we talk about journalism, we not only talk about the automation of communication, but about a form of communicative automation. I, in this sense, I think it is not enough to talk about um, human machine interaction. Uh, it's more about human machine relationships as an understanding of an input output relation does not go far enough to understand automation and AI and journalism, we need to develop an understanding of um, hybrid agency, a new form of agency that emerges in between or in the interplay of humans and machine. This not only include an internal perspective, that is what journalists, for example, uh, of journalists projection of agency to a mach machine or technology, as well as an Intern, external pers uh, perspective that concerns the, so to say, supra-individual agency um, of journalism with including machines. It is not technology alone that develops agency, but it emerges in such hybrid figurations. In journalism, for example, widespread ideas of robot journalism replacing people fall short it's about a refiguration of journalism as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wiebke. That, that's a lot to think about there too. <laughs> so thank you so much uh, for that contribution. Um, we'll keep moving, if we can, without being blown away in the storm, um, to our third speaker, Edson Tandog. Uh, Edson Tandog Jr. is an Associate Professor and Associate Chair for Research at the Wee Kim Wee School of Communication and Information and Director of the Center for Information Integrity and the Internet at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He's also an Associate Editor of Digital Journalism 
and associate editor of uh, Human Communication Research. His research focuses on the sociology of message construction in the context of digital journalism. He has conducted studies on the construction of news and social media messages. Um, his studies about uh, influences on journalists have focused on the impact of journalistic roles, new technologies and audience feedback on the various stages of the news gatekeeping process. And uh, this research has uh, led him to study journalism also from the perspective of news consumers, um, investigating how readers make sense of critical incidents in journalism and take part in reconsidering journalistic norms and how changing news consumption patterns facilitate the spread of fake news. He's also written an article with uh, what, to my mind, is still the best title of a journalism research article ever, uh, Journalism is Twerking, question um, mark. So, um, while I'm not expecting him to twerk, uh, I'm, I'm sure he's got lots of really interesting things to say. So, Edson, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. I can hear the, 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 the storm from, from here. So, hello from Singapore, and I hope you all stay safe and dry later. So um, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll um, sh share what, what, what I've been thinking about, uh, about the topic for today. And of course, we know that automation in the news is not only about uh, writing, but also to some extent is also about making sense of the news. And so what I would like to share uh, this afternoon is how journalists make sense of how audiences respond to the news. So many years ago when I was um, younger, you know, I did some studies uh, to understand how journalists were using web analytics, uh, which was at least at that time, newly introduced um, in many newsrooms. So web analytics refers to programs that track the digital footprint of um, audiences that users leave behind uh, in a website. So it provides information about audience behavior patterns, such as you know, time spent on, on an article or the website, the number of unique visitors, etc. And yes, this is an automatic uh, process. We may say it's an, an automated process where after initial programming by you know, human uh, designers or coders, the system then collects, analyzes, and visualizes audience data and provides journalists and news managers long-term but also real-time reports about uh, audiences. So as a former newspaper journalist, we never had this during my time at the newspaper. I was really intrigued by web analytics and how having access to detailed and comprehensive information about the audience can be quite powerful, if not transformative. So now we're not uh, only reading letters to the editor or relying on survey data to get a glimpse of what audiences want and what they actually do with news content. But with web analytics, we can quantify audience behavior and preferences in real time. And as we know, anything that can be quantified can be very persuasive. Soon, however, with, with, based on research uh, that has been done in this area, we realize that it is not the audience metrics per se, the metrics that are generated uh, by web analytics. It's not the metrics per se that is transforming news work, but the meanings that those involved in or deal with journalism ascribe, ascribe to these metrics. So from the audience side, studies have found that you know, automatically generated metrics such as number of shares or views that are shown alongside an article can be interpreted by other readers, not only as a signal of popularity, but also uh, to some extent of credibility, which may affect their news judgment and subsequent news behavior. So popular stories tend to be displayed more prominently on the web page. And they, because of that, they get shared more often, which makes them even more popular. So it's, it's a, a, a never ending cycle um, generated by because of metrics. And of course, uh, now, however, we know that with trolls and bots, online popularity can also be manufactured. So from the perspective of journalists, we have also seen how for some metrics have been regarded as the ends rather than as means to something. So for example, uh, some newsrooms provide staff with specific targets to increase number of unique visits uh, by a certain percentage. So one newsroom that uh, I visited many, many years ago, uh, they had a uh, uh, a goal of increasing their web, uh, unique visits by 10% from the previous year. 
Um, some reporters also take pride in seeing their articles gain high engagement metrics. Uh, some, if, if, when I visited some newsrooms, I would be introduced to a reporter. Uh, so this is the reporter who's bringing all these engagement uh, with the website. And, and some um, um, journalists take pride in that. Um, some organizations also incorporate web metrics in their assessments of employee performance that some reporters that we've spoken with um, in Singapore, for example, um, say that they now include web analytics data in their appraisal documents every year. Um, one important stage in the news construction process is what some call as the interpretation stage. This is when journalists engage in introspection. So after uh, a news has been selected, is edited, is published and distributed, uh, that's usually followed by a, a form of um, introspection. Uh, in the newspaper that I worked for uh, before, our editors would do a post-mortem meeting the following day to reflect on today's paper. Basically looking at okay what 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 they did right or, or what was not very effective, but in online newsrooms where there are no definite deadlines, if a story breaks, it has to be up soon. There really is no chance to engage in these kinds of deep reflections about every single editorial decision that one makes. That sometimes you know an editor might get surprised when when they look at the homepage and. It's like all BTS stories in there. And I, I hope there are BTS fans in here. So time spent on introspection is one thing, but the nature of introspection uh, is another. So during my field work for my dissertation eight years ago, but and also based on field work that many other researchers have done um, more recently, we've heard the how the phrase doing well has become part of the newsroom lexicon, especially during editorial meetings. So that story did well, uh, this topic is going to do well, or this article is not doing well, so we need to change it. So doing well refers to performance on web analytics, uh, almost exclusively refers to performance based on web analytics. And some editors we spoke with even had a criteria for what would constitute uh, doing well in their newsroom relative to their news organization size. Is it 5,000 views or 50,000 views? But uh, also, the, 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 what would constitute as a golden metric for a newsroom has also evolved, evolved over time from number of hits, then to number of views, to number of unique visitors, to time spent, and now talk, people talk about scroll depth. What is common across these uh, different metrics is that these are automatically collected and reported by the web analytics system and then given meaning by a human decision maker. So in a sense, it is the form of journalistic sense making, but now also driven by automation. So I'll end there. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, uh, that was fantastic. And in fact, I think leads in very well to our, our fourth and final speaker as well. Um, Edson, you've talked so much about uh, the, the work in newsrooms already. So our, our fourth speaker is someone who has spent quite a bit of time in newsrooms. He is a visiting policy fellow with the Oxford Internet Institute. But in his day job, I believe he has now taken on the role of head of digital and innovation with the New Statesman. Um, uh, where he uh, is leading efforts to bring together exceptional journalism with data-centric digital transformation and accelerate the title's growth. Uh, prior to his appointment at the New Statesman, David uh, Tomczak uh, spent three years at the Evening Standard as digital editor-in-chief, leading all digital editorial content and journalism across platforms, including the co uh, coverage of two general elections in the UK. Um, during the tenure there, he also led the title through record-breaking growth, winning numerous awards, including the Grand Prix Drum Award in 2019, not long after which he became digital publisher and was responsible for the Evening Standard's digital bottom line. Um, so hopefully, and I'm sure he will be able to provide uh, really fascinating insights into what this looks like from the news media professionals' uh, side. So David, over to you. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Good morning. Um, hi, I'm delighted to be with you uh, this afternoon. Actually, it's early morning in London, which is not a great time for me. But anyway, um, good afternoon. Um, as mentioned, my name is David Tomczak, and I've spent the last 20 or so years working as a journalist 
an editor running newsrooms. Um, I've actually left the New Statesman Media Group. Um, that was after about a year with them and I'd finished my work there. Um, my final stint was as the uh, Chief Operating Officer. And as mentioned, amongst other things, um, innovation across our titles was a big part of the job, which included, of course, the use of machine learning. So I come to this discussion as really a practitioner who um, can hopefully bring an insider's view of how people see the technology in our industry. Um, as Vipka and Edison have already outlined, there are many different ways that this technology can be used in newsrooms and by news companies. Um, there are indeed debates over what the technology even is. And of course, as Rasmus said, to date, it feels like AI is being done to the news by platforms as opposed to being developed by news for newsrooms. Um, I think to a few in the industry, to an extent even, it can feel a little overwhelming. Um, I think I was really interested by Vipka's friend's quote. Um, I found that fascinating to see the, the skepticism in there. And I, I understand where that's coming from. And I've met many people who feel they welcome technical change, but fear the impact of this technology on journalism, on quality, for example, or where the journalists will lose their jobs. Um, there are even bigger existential fears, like will big tech use the tech this type of technology is the final nail in the coffin for journalism. Um, of course, a good dose of skepticism is very healthy and we wouldn't be journalists if we weren't skeptics. But at a practical level, for me, I think the opportunities that the technology presents are exciting and very much outweigh the risks. And um, I, thankfully, I'm not alone. Uh, to quote Rasmus's latest trends and prediction report, that's the one that he mentioned that um, surveys digital uh, leaders in news in particular, I think. Um, I think something around 70% of newsroom leaders saw AI as the most important enabling technology in journalism. Um, Rasmus, you can correct me if that's wrong, but um, it can't be all bad if, uh, if so many peers find the technology a potentially positive influence. Um, for me, AI really sparked an interest in my newsrooms in the UK about four years ago when big tech platforms started to roll out home voice assistant technology that was powered by AI. We'll all remember the, the different home devices that were being advertised. Um, back then, I suppose we'd already incorporated AI in the form of third parties to help with some of the backend processes like discovering trends, um, much of which has been described. It was really through simple dashboards that we were using the technology and that came through third party sort of plug and play type of software. A lot of the stuff looked at web analytics in the way that Edison just mentioned. And I recognize very much of what he says when it comes to the use of web analytics for um, things like setting targets for staff or trying to make sense of the ecosystem that's around us. But anyway, about four years ago, I was digital editor in chief of the Evening Standard, as mentioned. And at the time, I felt we could do things in collaboration with the big tech platforms that could benefit our journalism and really bring new audiences to the newspaper. And bear in mind, uh, voice is something that was really very new at the time. Uh, Siri had existed for quite some time, but there wasn't the ability to really broadcast into homes in the same way. And newspapers have often been ahead in some of the adoption and testing with this technology. So there was a, an environment that was ripe for uh, this type of collaboration, but collaboration was required because of the complexity of the technology. In fact, big tech was even prepared to underwrite the costs, which to be honest, even I was suspicious about it first, so much so that I actually, I set up a regular informal group with some friends and peers from the big titles um, called the AI Media Working Group. And we just wanted to make sure that we weren't being divided and conquered, so to speak, by this sort of Trojan horse of big tech money. Um, and it ended up being quite a good social, actually. But anyway, um, that was about four years ago. And over time, uh, and I think this is true in many newsrooms that have been adopting this type of technology in a more hands-on way, not just using, using those third-party plugins. Um, I think I've come to realize that collaboration, whether it's in the industry or the big tech platforms, is really a key to the industry's journey using this type of technology. So collaboration is really the the main thing on my mind at the moment. Um, I think day to day, other things, and Edison touched a little bit on, we've talked briefly about things like fake news, but day to day, you know, the technology is being used to assess things like the veracity of news. Um, but there are sort of two or three other main areas that are at the forefront of people's thinking. And they've already been touched on, as I say, but just to sort of 
uh, clarify, there's an idea of can this technology help with efficiency? Uh, can it help add value? And that could mean, you know, the New York Times actually has got a great example where things like archives can be uh, trawled and used properly. Um, and can this type of technology help with scale? So that was something that we were doing very much at the New Statesman just before I left, looking at how we can create extra more content from uh, different types of data sources. And I think over time, uh, there's another area which is becoming a little bit more interesting from my perspective, and that's to what extent are newsrooms actually willing to share data. I'm, I'm doing some work at the moment for the European Commission. It's looking at how can uh, newsrooms in Europe potentially uh, use their combined force to use this type of technology in an effective way. And it feels like the best way of doing that is bringing data together. Um, of course, the big issue is that data is often seen as something that needs to be guarded. And so I think the, the next stage will be looking at how data can be used uh, across newsrooms in a way that's effective for all the different platforms. Um, so yeah, that's that's kind of where I am. I think that as policymakers and, and regulators uh, start to catch up with some of the, the platforms, there'll be more debate on that. And uh, but by and large, I feel like newsrooms are happy to to be using this this technology and collaborating with others. Um, I might sit here to um, see any questions coming through on Slido, so please, if you have questions, uh, post them now. Um, but that was a really fascinating discussion, I thought, um, uh, amongst such a wonderful panel. Um, I think what really came through, um, uh, just while we're waiting for other questions to, to come through, um, what really came through here was, for me, a kind of a sense that there is a lot of the instant inst interstitial and interpretive work that's going on between the different actors, both human and non-human actors, I guess, in this, in this network, not to get all Latour in here, but, uh, um, you know, the, the, the different imaginations of uh, automated technologies, of AI, of algorithms and so on, of what the metrics mean, as Edson was talking about as well, between um, between journalists, technologists, the users themselves, uh, various other stakeholders, there is a lot of um, translational work that seems to be going on basically between uh, between them about these tools and technologies and metrics and everything else. Um, and I, I do wonder to what extent there, there are still lots of misunderstandings or mis, misinterpretations perhaps going on um, uh, between these different stakeholders. So to what extent, I guess, to, to ask this quite broadly, to what extent are we speaking the same language actually across these different groups? And to what extent do we still see um, people pushing in very different directions, I guess, with these technologies? Um, that's a very broad question, I know, but uh, I'm wondering if any of you have any thoughts on this. So, so maybe I can add to that this. Um, so I am about to start to talk to people working in positions like the one David had. <laughs> so um, innovation, development, product development, and so on and so forth. With in particular, when it comes to AI and automation. And what I hear from these people, from these roles in media organization is that 80% of their work is explaining what it's about. So, so fostering an understanding in a media organization. So, and that that is most the most important part in their work, as they say. So, um, and takes much more time than actually doing it or implementing it. So, far beyond such technologies are entering media organizations and newsroom. There's a lot of talk and a lot of about these imaginations, um, as you said, about what technologies can do. And this is also yeah, influencing the further development. And that is why I think it's so important that we not only look at the technological framework, so to say, and try as social scientists to understand what it all means, but exactly look at these interface so so to say between what people are doing with it yes thank you um else has uh, other things to add to this 
I mean, maybe briefly from my, my um, I think one of the currents that sort of flow around um, anything of importance in our society is a sort of a self-promotional current. And I think uh, we need to sort of keep in mind that a lot of our conversations uh, about anything important, including automation and the use of AI in the news and elsewhere, is driven by self-interested actors, but not necessarily uh, in a bad way. I mean, I have my own self-interest as well. You know, we all we all do. There's nothing sort of intrinsically wrong about that, but nonetheless self-interested. And a lot of the conversation will reflect that. Um, when we've looked, for example, at news coverage of AI in UK media, uh, while it's true that there is the sort of the occasional killer robot story illustrated with a still from Terminator 2 or T-600 sort of wrecking havoc, uh, actually, the vast majority of stories about AI is driven by industry sources, um, uh, and the and many of the experts who appear in in, in the coverage of AI are uh, experts who hold dual appointments, who are have full time jobs or or part time jobs with tech companies in addition to the work they do uh, as academics. Um, and I, I think we should recognize that this might apply within organizations as well, um, that a lot of the conversation around the use of AI and, and automation will, will play out in part as conversations between different groups within newsroom who have different priorities, uh, want to spend money in different ways, um, and necessarily will promote what they prefer. Uh, that applies to the people who may want to spend it on more reporters, as well as the people who want to spend it on more automation. So I would just sort of say, I think there is an element of promotional discourse. And of course, this applies to the people who rule us as well. I mean, the way in which governments talk about AI um, and the way in which I as a citizen should not at all be worried in any way or shape or form by the use of facial recognition by the police or the use of social profiling and social services and the like, because, you know, trust your government. Uh, you know, this, the same promotional discourse will also be used, I think, internally in news organizations and, uh, and externally um, in sort of public discourse around this. Um, and I think it's been, in some ways, I think sort of social scientists are having a little bit of a field day sort of challenging, uh, you know, these discussions with various of sophisticated Latourian or postmodern moves and warning us all against reifying and naturalizing this technology and, and whatnot. But I have to say the people I meet who are most disenchanted with public discourse around AI are, are professors of AI who work in computer science who think we are all off our rocker, basically, in the way in which we talk about it. Um, and who I think by now has sort of basically, in many cases, given up on talking to journalists or policymakers because they feel it's so stupid what they have to deal with. Um, and, and that they are just never uh, taken seriously. And they're always sort of put on platforms with sort of various professional promotionalists or self-styled, you know, critical thinkers or whatnot, uh, many of whom, you know, uh, you know, would, would struggle to explain even the most rudimentary elements of, uh, of any of the technologies that they uh, profess about. Thank you. Can I just add to that? I think that's really interesting. Um, I think there's definitely a, a big distinction between using the technology in, in, in the news industry and in journalism more broadly, and then how it's reported. And the, it's, it's the, the two things are, are, uh, are, two ends of the same story, but they're not the same, if that makes sense. Um, and in terms of using them in newsrooms, uh, to, to Vika's point, I think the way that these types of technologies end up actually gaining momentum is when people who are in the businesses demonstrate the potential value, that's the key. So being able to show that um, there's a value to a workflow or there's a value to the audience, or there's a value to uh, the, the commercial team, those, those, those things are very, very, uh, they're tantalizing for whoever has the, I suppose, the, the budget to allocate or, um, or similar. So, uh, you know, it, it's not, I think that the other thing is that this, the, the, the technology is being spoken about so much that people fear being left behind. There's this sort of, there's almost a fear as well about not just the technology and its implications, but being left behind. So, um, often, if you're in my shoes, it's it's sometimes quite easy if you can show a tangible benefit, some 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 even if it's a small value, um, you know people are aware the technology exists and they, they want to do stuff with it as a result. And they're quite happy to play. Um, think the 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 role of the 
the, the big tech platforms in that is something that I, I feel still needs to be debated um, quite rigorously. Um, and and remembering that the, the, the value in a lot of this technology only exists if you've got data attached to it. Um, and, and so the debate really is around the data, frankly, as opposed to rolling out algorithms or anything similar is learning. Uh, although that's very, very important. That's, that's, the, uh, that's standing on the shoulder of the giant of data. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's fascinating. I think it's, it's, uh, it's it, the, putting this stuff into newsrooms is, is uh, very difficult still. Edson, did you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, although I, I hope you can hear me. I think I'm having issues with my internet. It's, it's also started raining here um, where I am, but, but we, yeah, not as strong as, as you know, what I'm hearing from there. I think for me, what I just wanted to add is um, in journalism studies, for example, uh, there's a, the, the uh, prevailing uh, normalization hypotheses where um, uh, journalists usually normalize technology, uh, adapting them into how they do their work. Um, I think that has been, uh, I would say, a very uh, fruitful framework. But I think it, it's also important for us to think how journalism has been adapted for technology. Um, I think that's probably one, one um, constraint that, that we face is that, is that we, we treat journalism as something that's monolithic and that technologies have to be adjusted to to fit into journalism, but maybe because of that preoccupation uh, with, with that framework, uh, we, we may not be, uh, we may be losing track of how journalism actually has been transformed to fit into uh, these technologies that uh, we're witnessing. All right, thank you very much. We've now One got point a... to add, can, can I add something? Okay. So I, I, I think it's, it's important that we think, not only think about it, as adopt, adapting technology. So it's not only adapting that uh, technology is throwing on journalism, thrown on journalism, so to say. I think it's a constant redevelopment and redevelopment also for journalistic purposes. And, 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 put in, and so we are journalism researcher, that is our main field of interest. But what we see there is that, that there's also a big discussion of so do we need in-house solutions? Uh, can we use the solutions that uh, the big industry is providing? Or, and, and I observe that, that as a constant, yeah, re, re constant rediscussing um, what is purposeful for journalism in particular. So that really makes a difference when it comes to different fields in society. You know, Vika, we did, sorry, just that we did a, mm -hmm. this AI and media working group that we have has someone who um, looks at corporate venture capital, who works in a B2B title, a, a guy called Jim Moss, and he's really interesting. Um, anyway, he he did a, we do presentations to each other, and he did a presentation on investment in, in AI and the different, the different areas of the economies where investment comes from for this type of technology. Um, and based just on investment, the idea that this type of technology will come from within the media industry is virtually unthinkable. Um, so, and this is why I go back to the idea of collaboration. I think it's really important that we, because we can't afford it, we need to find a way of working with other, other groups to, to not have it imposed upon us to your point. Um, you know, I think it's really, it's, uh, it, no matter how you look at it, if you follow the money, that's probably where the influence will come from with something with technology like this. Um, so I think your, your points, it's really interesting in that, uh, you know, hopefully what you're describing won't happen, that we'll be able to have more control, but I think we'll only be able to do it if we collaborate with others. I almost hate to, hate to break up this really interesting conversation between the panel, but we now have a, a number of really good questions uh, from the audience as well. In fact, I might just ask you, there's a handful of two specific uh, uh, panelists as well, so I might, might just ask you to give a very quick answer if you can to some of those. And in fact, David, following on from what you, you just said, but also where you ended up in your original uh, presentation. Um, there are a couple of questions that ask about the, um, the kind of data sharing collaboration across organizations and where you see useful um, synergies or useful benefits, I guess, from, from doing that. Um, it's, it's a great question. Um, it's it's, it, it's uh, a question that I'm grappling with at the moment with the, with the European Commission. Um, the, so I think, there, the, the, the areas of data where 
I believe journalists at the moment across different organizations which are really prepared to collaborate is around content. Um, so, you know, there are lots of one-off investigations that we could cite um, where um, people have come together. The Panama Papers is probably the most famous at the moment, but where people have come together and, and shared data to create stories. Um, that's done in a, a, in a sort of one-off, almost piecemeal way at the moment. I think that that could probably be improved. Um, I think at the other end of the spectrum is, the, uh, is audience data, which ironically, newsrooms already share with platforms and don't really think about it. So, um, you know, we're sharing data right now with Zoom, but, you know, Google or um, Facebook and all the other large tech platforms have lots of data that, frankly, they can amalgamate across different um, audience data. They can amalgamate from different organizations. Newsrooms aren't thinking in those terms. And I think if we got to a point where we could work together with data effectively at the content level, then ultimately we'd be happy to share data at the audience level. And you might wonder, well, why aren't we sharing data at the audience level already if Google and Facebook have it themselves? And the issue is, is because that's how we currently monetize most of our content when it comes to things like advertising. So there's this fear that sharing will mean, sharing audience data will mean that we give up some of our, our, um, our, our competitive advantage commercially. And that's not true. In fact, if you add the data together, you can all benefit from that, I believe. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's that, that, that's kind of where I think we are at with data sharing. Thank you, and that maybe uh, leads on to a question for Edson as well, um, from Alyosha asking um, about your experience with metrics. You talked about this move from initial skepticism to verbally normalizing what's doing well in newsrooms, uh, which is a really interesting and ill-defined term, I guess. Um, so where do you see the future of metrics? Oh, that's a. <laughs> Very difficult question. I may, may not have. I may, I may need uh, a few more years to answer this question. Um, I, I, what I would say though, now that we, we, if we, when we, we try to design uh, follow-up studies um, over the years, and I think for me, it, now now that it's considered normal uh, in the newsroom, it's it's no longer considered something that's new. Um, mo almost all newsrooms use either a paid version or a Google Analytics version of, of web analytics. Um, I, I think it's even more. Uh, important to see how it's affecting news work now that it's almost invisible in the newsroom. It's something that's uh, as it has reached what they call a taken for grantedness stage, um, and and the effects might be even more visible. For me, I'm I'm part I'm personally interested in the use of analytics for um, assessment of personnel and how it also transform might be transforming uh, journalists' personal attitudes about their work uh, and about what they think they have to do um, to perform well um, in that setting. So I'm, 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 I'm going into that direction. But in terms of how the technology is going to, is going to continue to improve, um, we also know there are limitations to, to what analytics can say. It can tell us what's happening, but, may, but still not explain why. Um, and also the metrics that are, are being used to assess what's doing well is also changing. Um, and I think that the future of web analytics would be how it can be fine to, to serve the purposes of, of, of journalism, at least from the tech side. But from, from a journalist's uh, point of view, I think I'm really interested in how it is uh, maybe quietly transforming how we even understand the work that we have to do. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we, we only have a few minutes left and it's very much in my interest to finish on time because I still have to give a talk at six. Um, but um, we have a, a really, uh, I think, interesting question here from Mark Andreevich, um, uh, who's curious to hear your response as a panel uh, to um, arrangements, uh, I guess, regulation like the Australian News Media Bargaining Code, which um, I'm, I'm sure you've, you've followed the various debates and the brief ban on news on Facebook that resulted from it as well. So uh, um, yeah, curious to see if you've got any thoughts on, on these kinds of laws and regulations. Or if no one wants to touch that hot potato. So just a general thought, um, I think that it backfired. <laughs> um, you know, I mean, honestly, though, there, there, there needs to be uh, some a better effort at regulatory uh, um, 
sort of mechanisms or the creation of regulatory mechanisms for uh, the use of this technology, but it goes far beyond the news industry. Um, and it's easier for me to report on it than to probably try and get involved in the regulation, but that, you know, it doesn't feel like it's, it's uh, it doesn't feel like the experts are doing what they should be doing yet. I mean, I suppose uh, if an Australian citizen asked me for a way of thinking about uh, assessing the efficacy of an arrangement uh, in this space, it would be first to say, what is the problem? And if the problem is the one is trying to address is the risk of market failure in terms of local news provision and in terms of news media that serve uh, underprivileged, historically underprivileged uh, groups, uh, whether they're marginalized, ethnic minorities, indigenous populations and like. If that's the problem one wants to solve, um, then I suppose the policy should be judged on whether it has effectively solved that problem in a way that is transparent and accountable. Um, and if, if it has failed to solve that problem, uh, or if it, it is, does not ensure any kind of transparency or accountability in terms of flows of money, then I would probably have reservations about it as a citizen. All right, I think that might echo some of the views in the room as well, but I'm not going to speak for everyone. Um, Maybe just to finish off, then we've got about four minutes left. Um, uh, there is a question, ironically, here from uh, an anonymous user, um, whether you could speak to the importance of trust and what makes a platform or a piece of technology trustworthy. Um, perhaps there are some views on the panel. Or not? So yeah, maybe I can add something to that. So what I found fascinating that, that we are witnessing these development of, of that part of AI that calls that is called explainable AI. So um, that with the, the so I'm not an ec, um, expert in computer science, but I understand that as throwing technology on technology to better understand technology. And that I find that totally fascinating. And it comes with the idea, as I would say, that we need trustful technology, especially when it comes to journalism. So that that so why is journalism research around? Because we want to understand the selection criteria of journalists and news organizations as they produce a kind of communication that is so important for society. Of course we adopt the same approach to technology that is used in this um, re, um, realm, in this field. So, and also in other parts of society. So I, I think that is a, a natural development, so to say, but it's ironic in itself if we try to do that by technological means, so to say. Thank you, Wiebke. Um, uh, Asmus, I'm not quite sure if you have your hand up or if this is actually um, Zoom doing the, the AI thing and, and recognizing your gesture. No, I do have my hand up. It's just that I'm conscious that we're about to wrap up. And I thought I'd say something towards the end um, to sort of express an element of sort of what I think to be sort of fact-based hope or cautious empirical optimism uh, around the role of automation uh, in news. Because I think it's it's often it's it's easy to get sort of uh, focused on the challenges and the and the complications and they are real uh, and and there will be consequences, also negative consequences and there will be people who will be the losing end of a transformation. That's always the way in which creative destruction works out and we can't be naive about that. I would also just say that you know what I try to sort of keep in mind is that I would say there's sort of almost all journalists I meet are curious and capable individuals uh, who, who, you know, who want to, you know, do better journalism tomorrow than was done yesterday and who are not sort of transfixed and sort of kept captive by a picture of the past. They, they want to do better in the future. And it's also the case that the news industry, while it's taken a very serious uh, knocking over the last two decades, is globally is still a very large industry. The World Association of News Media, you know, estimates the total turnover of the global newspaper industry alone at about 100 billion US dollars a year. Um, so we have very capable individuals, and we need to remember that while much smaller than the tech companies, there's still a lot of money. Um, and if the news industry invests the same in R&D as, say, you know, car manufacturers do, about 15 percent, 
um, and were as focused as companies, not on sort of milking declining assets or running a sunset industry uh, uh, in an asset stripping fashion, but in investing in the future, you know, I think they have staff, colleagues, talent in their organizations uh, who will have great ideas for doing journalistic things, business things, organizational things with new technologies. And I think they will find um, that there is a business case uh, for doing it if they're willing to put up the investment and break with where I think a lot of news organizations have inadvertently ended up in recent decades, which is they've moved from being in the past technology makers who made or commissioned the technologies they relied upon. You know, printing technology was developed by newspaper publishers, broadcasting technology by broadcasters to technology takers. Uh, who were largely relying on technologies developed by others for other purposes that were then sort of secondhand uh, adapted for publishing purposes. So I think there is an opportunity here in addition to a number of challenges. I'm not saying everyone will make it or that everyone will benefit equally from it, but I think the opportunities are there. And I think it's up to journalists and publishers to also sort of fight that out amongst themselves internally in the industry, whether they will sort of settle for the role as technology takers or whether the industry and the profession will seek to seize this role as technology makers again and try to define their own terms also technologically moving forward or whether they want to sort of rely on secondhand technologies that are handed to them uh, by others. Thank you. That's a call to action if ever I've heard one. And I think uh, for those of us who work in journalism or media research or who work in journalism and the media, that's a, a great provocation uh, to end on. So um, thank you all, thank you very much to this wonderful panel and um, uh, greetings to all of you over where you are and hopefully we can see you again sometime in person as well. And thank you everyone on Zoom as well as here in the room for what's been a really uh, long day but also very exciting and, and, and stimulating day. Um, so this finishes today's program as far as ADMS is concerned but um, for those of you who are here, you're very welcome to come over to F Block, um, uh, grab a drink and a canapé, and uh, hear me talk for a bit more um, before we go over to the golf club. Um, so thank you all, and um, see you again tomorrow morning. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Uh, so sorry, but just before um, the in-person people. The uh, QTX event. Uh, just, just noting that today uh, the COVID restrictions did change at 4 p.m. So what that means is um, from now on, uh, when you're eating and drinking, you'll have to remain seated. Um, so what that means for the QTX event is that you can grab a drink and some canapes on the way in, but you'll have to consume that seated within the lecture theatre. So. Um, We'll leave in about two minutes. Um, if anybody doesn't know the way to F block, uh, just follow me and Kathy.